Hey everybody, welcome to Nation. My name is Jersey and we are here. What's going on? If it is your first time checking us out, what's up? My name is Jersey. Have a look around. Uh, this is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, all of those fun places and available on YouTube where we have our conversation. So go to YouTube if you haven't and uh, write a comment. That would be awesome. Um, if you are one of the elite, one of the cool kids, one of the nation who does all of that stuff, listens, watches, thumbs up our videos, comments, and of course, most importantly, buys your supplies through me, what is up? It is because of you that I got to get ice cream from the ice cream truck this year. That chocolate taco was super expensive, so thank you guys for letting me do that. Um, a couple quick shout outs this week. I want to say what's up to Ryan Johnson. What's going on to Brandon Evans and Shane Bernauer. I, if I butchered your name, let me know. Uh, but if you want to shout out, all you got to do is just comment or text me or say what's up or say you hate the show or love the show. I love to give shout outs to my haters too. So <laughs> let me know on that. Uh, every week we do a giveaway also. And this week we are actually recording it two weeks in advance. So I don't have a winner this week. But if you want to win, all you have to do is comment on Facebook, or I'm sorry, on YouTube, and we pick a random winner every single week, except for this week. So go ahead, comment away. Um, I am sitting with my buddy, Mr. DJ. What's going on, man? Should I, do I call you Coach Carroll? Is that is absolutely, that, bro? Is that law? Absolutely. Right? absolutely. <laughs> what's going on man hey so for everybody out there everybody knows you anyway but tell everybody what you're doing like what you're into now kind of like where you're at tell us about yourself yeah man so uh, thanks for having me on appreciate it uh, I love that we can both go by our affiliates maybe we can rob a bank after this jersey and yeah, right. a little bit. <laughs> I love um, but yeah no I mean I appreciate you having me on um yeah, man, just a longtime hustler, uh, first time listener and caller, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm excited to be on the show. Hopefully, we can bring some some information to uh, to the listeners and for all of you out there that are listening. Uh, appreciate you tuning in. Um, you know, I know you guys are super busy as being entrepreneurs and business owners. There's always shit to do, but uh, I think that it's very important that as entrepreneurs we take some time because we're so production driven. Like if we're not like achieving something, we feel like we're wasting our time or we're not, we're not being productive. Um, but it's very important to kind of reach charge and, and cool down. Um, I, I had a, a coach tell me one time, he said, DJ, you're, you're like a, uh, a racehorse and you can't just run a race your entire life. Like the horse eventually comes off the track, has to cool down, go through some rehab. And so I think things like this is, is very important for entrepreneurs because it kind of gives you a different perspective. And um, I love it because I get to bring some value to the listeners. But yeah, I mean, for those of uh, you that are listening or watching, I guess on YouTube that don't know me, um, you can find all of my stuff on social media, whatever your favorite platform is, just hashtag Coach Carol two R's, two L's and, uh, started my first business out of high school and turned down several football scholarships, decided that I wasn't going to go that traditional route. Long story short, started with 300 bucks, Walmart weed eater and a Walmart push mower. And I was in business, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of trials and tribulations grew that business to a little over 3 million revenue have done over a dozen, uh, merger and acquisition deals since then. That was 2007. And, um, yeah, man, just, I'm a hustler at heart and, and, love anybody that wants to take that risk to be an entrepreneur because it's it's a good fucking time to do it right now because the economy's strong i really think it's not going to go anywhere in the next uh foreseeable future i think we're about to roll through the 1920s again which was like kind of the age of of proprietorship and being that owner operator yeah. um and yeah man, i'm just excited to be here and kick it with you for a little while and uh hopefully drop some knowledge Nice, nice. And tell everybody, so you have a podcast also. What's yes. the name of your podcast? Like what, how do they find that? So um, the Sales Factory podcast, you can pretty much get it anywhere that, that podcasts are out there. Obviously, I try to push people to iTunes because iPhone users spend about 30% more than Android users do when they buy online. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more of an iTunes guy. Uh, but you, get, you guys can find it on anywhere, uh, any of the outlets. And then, again, social media on, on YouTube. I put a ton of content out there. It's, it's called the Sales Factory. And it's really focused around sales because I quickly learned that you could have the best mower, the best weed eater, the best squeegee, the best whatever gizmo gadget you want to have. But if you don't have jobs, 
more importantly, if you don't know how to market, advertise, prospect, sell, and close, it doesn't matter because the bank's probably going to come get whatever that gizmo gadget is eventually. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really, it became, um, it became fundamental to me. You know, when I played sports, I learned five sports in high school and the coaches always, they just hounded on you that the kids that were the best at high school level were the kids that practiced the fundamentals when they were in elementary and middle school. And it was true, right? The best ball handler was the kid that was always handling the ball, like just nonstop handling the ball. And so what I realized, I took a lot of the stuff I learned in sports and transcended that into business. Um, also maybe where the coach Carroll thing came from, because I was just, I, I love being able to fire people up, you know, it's a big stigma around like nobody wants to be a motivational speaker or inspirational speaker. Like, I fucking love that. Like when somebody comes up to me and like, bro, you motivated me. I'm up 30%. Cool. Like that, that is fantastic. But yeah. yeah, I mean, sales became very fundamental for me. And so that's why I made the podcast. I wanted to circle that around teaching people how to sell. And um, you know, I, I really think in the contractor proprietor space, where that, you know, that technician mentality is, is really strong. Um, you don't, you don't see that being taught or they, they don't necessarily think it's important and without sales, nothing else in business happens. Yeah. It's sell or die. Like that is the, the real well, theory. theory. <laughs> if you don't sell, you will eventually, even if you have a thousand clients right now, next year, you're going to have 900 clients. You know, like yep. people will die and move and change you to somebody else and they will go some, even if you're the best and most loved person, people still die. Like you're going to lose customers. And if you're not selling or you don't know how to sell, not only are you not going to get to that point, which by the way, if I know people who have bought businesses who are now doing 10% of what they did when they bought the business because they didn't quite grasp that side of it. It's, it's like when you see a restaurant going out and the, the cooks buy the restaurant, well, they know how to cook the food, but they don't know anything else about the restaurant. The restaurant fails for a second time. Sales is Absolutely. the hugest, biggest part of business because, and that's why salespeople always get paid more in the companies. They're always the guys that are driving the Ferraris and the big, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies because they're the ones that bring in the money to make everybody else, everybody else's job exist because of the sales that are brought in. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm in the middle of writing my uh, second book called the Hunter head game. And it really, you know, my first book, phenomenal phone calls. I wrote that because I, I really saw that entrepreneurs in the beginning, but at least my perspective, right? Cause I think, I think we really need to kind of go back and realize there's two types of entrepreneurs. There's the entrepreneurs that start with pardon my language, but they're dick in their hand and that's it. Like they got zero money. And then you've got people that either have an uncle, a family business, you know, something a they, they kind of got a little bit of a leg up and, and I'm not hating on either one of them. I just can identify with the guys that had nothing because literally when I started my first business, I had a hundred dollars saved up. I borrowed a hundred dollars from my mom and a hundred dollars from my grandma. And like, that's how I started my business. And what happens is you have to play by a different set of rules when you start at that level versus when you kind of have that, that starting seed money or you're taking over an existing business. Yeah. And so I wrote phenomenal phone calls because I've quickly found out like advertising's fantastic, right? Make the phone ring. What, and that's, you read all that online, how to get your phone ring. And like, well, what if you don't have money, bro? Like how you see, yeah. like you can't, people aren't just going to make your phone ring for free. And so I said, all right, the only thing I can control is outbound activities. So I'm going to learn how to sell over the phone. And, um, till even to this day, the three biggest projects that we've ever done have came from me self generating on a cold call. And so, um, but the next book was that hunt your head game. And you're exactly right. Getting people in the mindset that, if you're an entrepreneur in today's world and you're starting from zero, you're a hunter. You can't just sit back and gather berries. You'll be feeble and starve to death or worst case scenario, you're going to get eaten by the hunter when he comes along. So it, it really is just a, a lot of mindset stuff that I think entrepreneurs need to need to work on. Um, because if, if this is broken, it doesn't matter how good you are at everything else. Um, it'll, it'll never work. Yeah. And people always look kind of for that, like one way that everybody does it. But like you're saying, there's two ways of doing it. If you cashed out your 401k and that's how you got into business, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's like not having a ski lift ticket. You know, if you got the lift ticket, you're taking that to the top. You're not worried about what's underneath the snow as you're trying to climb the mountain. The people who don't have that, if they got to get up the mountain without that, they're looking for the trees and the holes and the, so many other things they're focused on 
that the guy yeah. who had the cash in the beginning isn't. So yeah, I really am good analogy, man. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love analogies. <laughs> I know. I, I, I love uh, poor analogies too when I say stuff and I'm like, that was so stupid, but it sounded good in my head. <laughs> No, they're good. I mean, it's, it helps people, you know, I like analogies because it helps people see things from a different perspective. Cause a lot of times you'll explain something people will be like, yeah, okay. You see them glazed over and then it's like, oh, it's kind of like this. And they're like, oh, now I get it. Yeah. It's like uh, using TV analogies too. You're like, oh, you remember that one time that so-and-so did this on the show? And then they're like, oh yeah. Cause they can adjust like their feelings of that event happening as opposed to trying to just figure stuff out. Mm, but yeah, absolutely. Man. Sales are sales are huge. And I, I have a question for you. Now we've done okay. shows kind of on sales uh, before and um, this will be the best one. This will be the best one. It's already uh, started off. I've never seen a tree that amazing anyway in the background. So I, that's, I'm really, uh, like, that's all due to my girlfriend, bro. <laughs> she, okay. I mean, it, I think it was the day it might've actually been Halloween. She's like, can I put the tree up? I mean, she's like a Christmas <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I live here in downtown Louisville. We moved here a couple of years ago in the high rise and, uh, I mean, there's garland everywhere. It looks like Santa came in here and threw up, but bless yeah, her yeah. heart. She's the Christmas elf. So yeah. I nice just thought you had a back. really good green screen. Like that's, you know, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this old thing. Yeah. Just, no. no, but, um, in, in sales, there's people always want to talk about like, what could I do to make the, what could I do to, but in learning anything, anything system wise or business wise, you have to also know what the worst thing is because you can stay farther farther away from that but in your experience in sales in general and kind of everything you've done you know what's the worst thing or what's that one thing that doesn't sell like what is the biggest turnoff for people to pull out their wallets and this can be this can be anything from kind of once you generate that call right once like that's, that's kind of where I was going is in my mind I'm like all right well at what stage in the sales process are we at because there's certain things that will nuke a fucking deal. Something that'll nuke a deal in the beginning might not nuke it at the end, but nukes it at the end. Doesn't nuke it at the beginning. Does that make sense? Um, yep. So let me get, kind of give you a couple. So the first one, if we're talking about cold calling, cause like I'm talking about the guy that's dead broke, has no money to his names. Try, you know, I know it's window clean. Maybe you got a mop on a squeegee and like, bro, you're just trying to make some money. Right. Yeah. I don't like knocking doors because your time is valuable and the span of distance that you can cover compared to me covering it on a phone call, right? Like if you're already hungry, just go another week of being hungry. I promise you'll find some way to get by, but spend that week solid booking up the next week on the phone. It'll make you a little more efficient. But so on that, the guy that gets on the phone and tries to make the sell on the phone, big no, no. And I talk about this in phenomenal phone calls is Your goal and objective on a cold call is to sell nothing more than a face-to-face appointment. That's it. Um, If you're doing long-term sales, like in my ad tech company, Carol Media, you know, we're we're just calling to try to get a a webinar or a WebEx meeting or a Zoom meeting, something like this, to where I can actually feel like I'm there with the person, right? So trying to go in and sell on the first call and selling out of desperation, huge no-no. So that's strike number one. In the middle of the sales process, over talking and, and going past, you've already made the sale, right? The customer is asking you buying questions. How much does it cost? When can you get us scheduled? Uh, what's the next availability? Um, what colors does it come in? Things like those are buying questions. You've already gotten past that attention stage. What most people screw up on there is, they don't slide them into the close. They keep selling. We'll talk about that a little more, um, the difference between selling and closing, but they'll, they'll keep talking over the customer and the customer is like, bro, I just want to hand you my credit card and get the fuck out of here. And you just keep selling and selling and selling. So puking over it, that's strike number two. Okay. And then the last one is not asking for the business huge mistake. Um, and you know, this goes into an analogy or uh, not analogy, a, um, acronym that I call stud S T U D. And if you're listening, write this down. So S stands for specific next step. T stands for takeaway. U stands for urgency. D stands for deadline. If you don't have all four of those inside of a sales pitch, we'll call it. Um, you're, you're not, you're, I'm not going to say you're not going to make the sale, but the percentages are swing away. And this yeah. is what I do when I like coach clients or come in for consulting is you, you have to understand that Sales training is about increasing percentages. I always 
like to give the analogy of shooting free throws, right? There's nothing that you're the, the mechanics of a free throw. No one's going to show you something that like now you went from 30% to a hundred. No, like if you're at 60, your free throw coach is trying to get you to 70 because that could be the difference in going to a championship game or not going to a championship game. And yeah. so what I would say on that very last one is, is that specific next step. People don't push people into the clothes. They're just like, Oh, here's my quote. And if you like it, give me a call and we'll see what we can do. Like, no, it's terrible. Yeah. You got to give them the, the the solution. I don't even like calling it a quote. Give them that solution, and then and then go straight in for it and say, "Look, does everything that we talked about today make sense?" If they say yes, say, "Great, I got next Tuesday or next Thursday. Which one works better for you?" And yeah. just slide into that close. Those are, those would be my three big ones, kind of throughout the sales process. Yeah, I totally, 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 totally agree on the talking too much one. The two that's one of my favorite, like you could just F up a deal that way because here's the thing. What people don't understand is they think that everything they're saying is catching on. But if you're talking about how cheap you are and they're talking about frequency and uh, reliability, you're talking two different languages, but here's the other side of it. Do you feel that? Did you feel like when you're quiet, when no one's talking and you pause and things, it's just as powerful because it gets your body. Like when you're uncomfortable, people talk. When you're confident and comfortable, you can pause. And that's what really is picked up with people. And if you can pause enough or just shut up, they're going to talk. You know, it's, it's the same concept that once the information is given and they're to that point, it's just now decision time. Like there's no other sales if it's already in their brain. So mm-hmm. I love that. Love that. Love that. Good stuff, man. I told you it was going to be the best sales podcast. I'm telling you, it is. <laughs> it is though. That, that I, I, I like figuring out the worst things to do just as much as the good things because the good things may not work for everybody and in every zero, zone in every area, but the bad things, those are bad to everybody. You know, if you go that's punch true. your client in the face, you're not going to get the job. Like that's bad to everybody. <laughs> and across the board that you can learn more from that and kind of work your way up. So <laughs> I like that. It, when you, when you make a phone call, you're not trying to close somebody. Like you said, all you're trying to do is qualify a lead. All you're trying to do is take a cold call and make it lukewarm. All you're trying to do is say, Hey, would you give me the time of day? If they say yeah. yes, boom, next step. Like people who rush sales will get a, they'll get bad sales because if somebody does close, they're in just as big as a rush and they're going to just drop you as quick as you, they picked you up. Like, you have yeah. to go through a process. The hardest thing is like you said, when you're hungry, you're hungry, right? Like yeah. you have, like, if you've ever gotten to that point of being so hungry that you would do anything, you would eat bark, you would do like, you need it now you need it. To, and that's where a lot of these guys, especially in the beginning are, is the process feels like forever to create it. But like you said too, the fundamentals, you still have to go through the process and make those things because that is the foundation for the rest of your company. If you started window cleaning or pressure washing or lawn care or anything, and you just started yesterday, you are hungry to pick up anything. And somebody says, Hey, I need painting done. You're going to say, of course I can do that because it's something and it's money. Right. But that doesn't build the foundation. Like this is the long haul. We're building empires here. You know, yeah. you have to kind of Marty, build for the long Marty Grunder says you get to a million by saying yes to everyone. You get past a million by starting to say no. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the challenge is when you're new into the business, you like, you kind of have to do whatever you can to, to, to stay up above the, above the water, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why you see that small business administration statistic that 90% of businesses fail in the first five years because of undercapitalization. That's it. Like, I mean, they just don't, yeah. it's not that they didn't work hard enough or that they didn't, you know, have the skills or the ability or the wherewithal. It's the fact that they're just undercapitalized, man. I mean, it, it costs money. And, and this is what kills me about a seasonal business um, and, and why, you know, I went on to build other companies and, you know, now I'm up to about 74 rental units. The, the idea that a company can grow and survive operating seven months out of the year, eight months out of the year um, as a business is it's hard for me to even imagine because that's like going to Walmart, the largest corporation in the world and saying, Hey guys, new legislation just came out. You're only allowed to be open seven months out of the year. (laughs) They're going to go under. 
Like yeah. you, because you can't run a business like that. That's why what I love, and I know it goes against the norm and against what a lot of the, like the business consultants say in this industry. And, but in like cleaning and, and seasonality stuff, like the money is in being a sole proprietor and, and don't be ashamed to be that. There's so, I feel like there's so much fucking pressure to just like grow, 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 grow. One is you got to be self-aware enough to know that maybe you're a piss poor manager. I am. Yeah. I'm terrible. Like I'm just awful. That's why I don't like having operation guys anymore. My whole team is built up of girls that work in the office because they're self manning managing and like I can give them a task and they'll do their job. Um, you know, and, and then we work with other partner teams. I, I really think in entrepreneurship, you, you have to know yourself, man. You have to understand what's going on and uh, up here and in here, because if not, you're going to, you're going to hop on somebody's train that's giving you advice that may not know it. And that, and that's what I try to tell anybody that wants to be a coach or a motivational speaker is like, you need to understand the power of this job. Yeah. You, you know, there's so many guys and you know, we were talking about this before. It's like, if you got a microphone, you're an expert. It's like the challenge with that is I don't think enough people realize you're putting out information into the world that could negatively affect somebody. Right. Everybody, I, I get like everybody wants to help, but sometimes giving the guy the information that like, Hey, you can go do it. Rah, rah, rah. Um, makes his family become homeless in six months. And so I, I think there's, I think we're going to see that eventually catch up. Like, I mean, you know, and I love Gary V talks about this. It's like a lot of these people that that's their only business is like, they're going to get crushed because companies, that's the first thing you cut out is consulting whenever the economy goes down and uh, I just, I love entrepreneurship, man. I, I love sales. I love helping people. I try to stay as positive as, as possible. Uh, but at the same time, I also think it's my duty and obligation to kind of bring some realization to this stuff because I mean, that's, it's all I know. It's all I've done since yeah. I was a senior in high school. And I had, a, I had a chemistry teacher told me, she's like, DJ, you'll never be as successful trying to be an entrepreneur as if you just went to school and got a degree. Um, you know, when I talked to my guidance counselor, I'm like, Hey, I think I want to try this entrepreneurship stuff. Like it seems really cool. I had a mentor in high school that was a business owner and you know, there was nowhere to turn And my life purpose is, you know, eventually when I get old and you know, I'll probably be in a wheelchair, probably be all the way bald. I'll look like Charles Xavier. I want to make the X-Men school for entrepreneurs. I want, yes. I want to be able to build something to where kids can come to like a technical training school, but for entrepreneurship. And I think, I think we'll see that. Um, I think there's a huge void in it right now for the contractor space. Like if there was a school where you could go learn roofing, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, but not only just learn the technical training, but then you get six weeks of business training on the back end of it. Yeah. I think not, even if those guys don't start a business, they're the employees that would create, dude, they'd be rock stars because they're going to be oh, yeah. thinking like business owners. And that's the challenge when you go to hire people is like, they think like employees and not business owners. So sorry, yeah. they're off on a tangent there. No, that, that's, exactly, <laughs> that's it. If, if you're thinking like a business owner, then there's so many other things. When you're a business owner, you're the HR person, you're the uh, ad person, you're the marketing director, you're the uh, you know, the technician, you're the everything. So those guys who say, well, I want to be big someday, where are your weaknesses? Because I've not met anybody that's amazing at everything. I've not yeah. like my, my side of it is like the uh, structure of the business as far as like the paperwork and the, the, the invoicing and the collections, like that stuff. I hate oh, so much. <laughs> oh, I'm not good at it. I like surround yourself with somebody who could do that. But if you're a sole proprietor, if you're, if you're the one man show, which like I always say, there's no wrong way to do this. Like, however you're doing this, if you're listening right now, one man show, you got a hundred employees, whatever it's right because this is what you're doing. Right. But those yeah. guys, they don't have to necessarily have every piece of it because they're not trying to get to the one where they have to build the structure. So if you're building a structure, you have to have the cash flow to then hire an office person to do stuff you can't do or suck at. But now that office person isn't making you any money. So now you have to sell and make and produce so much more because now you're paying two salaries. Like there's Absolutely. a ton of things, like you said, it's just, it just isn't out there where people can find out, you know, all the benefits or, or I guess all the hardships that you have to go through or the things you have to know. That'd be amazing. Yeah. If, you could start a, if you could start an entrepreneur school that was just based on entrepreneur, like Dude. that, when you said that, that like, my brain was like, whoa, like that was a whoa moment. That's the goal. And it, you guys can't see it. So like I'm on the 25th floor here and literally like diagonally across the block is a huge 
public library and the front of it's like from like the 1800s and then they added on a big expansion in the back and I go out there and look at it all the time and I'm like that's it man that's the entrepreneur institute like something that size it could have housed people and you know I, I really I'll, so you got me all fired up about it now it's my idea is that you don't charge tuition that it's only on an application basis and what what I really think is our creativity as humans and it's it's kind of proven when you look at testosterone and, and how our hormones react, but men, especially between the ages of 16 to 25, were our most driven and our most creative. And so I can even tell now I'm 30, I don't have the juices flowing like I did at 22, 23. Fire doesn't burn. Um, and so for me, I think that if I could look across the nation and say, all right, your application isn't like what civic duties you did and what sports you played, because that's irrelevant. I want to know what your business plan is. And so we sort through, we pick the business plans. It's free to come. You get taught by other entrepreneurs. And then at the end of it, if you graduate at the top of your class, you get startup funding. And the cool thing I think that would be about that is that company that got startup funding goes on to make millions and millions of dollars 10 years later. Where are they going to get back to? They're going to get back to the Entrepreneur Institute that got them started. And um, that's for me, that's where I want to kind of leave my legacy is that you know, I'd like to have that old statue out front that gets, you know, the pigeon shit on and stuff. And uh, right, right, right. You know, then we got to hire a power washer to come in and clean it up. But it's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's something I think when, and I think about my life, it's like, I want to be remembered 200 years from now. And, um, you know, the cool thing is stuff like this, man, you, you, like what's going to be great is when you and I can look back on this podcast when we're 80 and be like, man, I remember that. Like, we'll probably like right. just be able to close our eyes and see it in our head or something by that time. But uh, <laughs> we'll be yeah, at home somewhere. I think, yeah. I think entrepreneurs are, I mean, they're, 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 the, they're the people that move the world forward. They're the innovators. Um, and without innovation, we don't grow. The, like, really, it just it all stays the same. And I just love that it's all rooted in capitalism. I mean, people that say that like, money doesn't matter and this, like, it does matter because no matter they're, what you're doing, they're not business on, owners. <laughs> it's, uh, right. I mean, yeah, they're clearly not business owners, but it, like businesses are in business to make money. And I remember when I started watching Shark Tank, I used to think Kevin O'Leary was the biggest dick in the world. I couldn't stand him. Now he's like my favorite shark on there. Like once I learned what yeah. perpetuity deals was, I was like, this guy's getting paid forever. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's understanding the inner workings, understanding that capitalism is what runs the world, runs our country. And, you know, the cool thing about that is it gives equal opportunity to everyone. Um, and, and I'm, I'm excited about that because that's, that gives me hope for the future. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I, there's certain things, traits that entrepreneurs have that no one else has. Like we all have ADD. That's just a fact. We're the only ones that can kind of take that and semi form it yeah. into something. You know awesome. what ADD is Josh? A ADD is what the people with slow minds call the people with fast minds. That's right. That's, that's there you go. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and the the fire that younger people have if you compare it all together like you know a business owner you you've done these conventions you've gone to conferences you've done all that stuff i can meet somebody and in the first you know 10 seconds of the conversation i could tell this person will be an entrepreneur and they'll be a successful entrepreneur it's this, it's a thing that you have and to be able to you know it a fire burns because of the fuel it's given. Like you can continue to feed that to some of these people and they could just take over the world. Every, every one of these, Kevin O'Leary started as a small business guy. I mean, I doubt, I, I don't know his story, but I doubt that he just one day woke up and won the lottery and decided to be a, you know, him. So. <laughs> well, cool. When we're ready for donations, I'll be sure to reach out to you. <laughs> ah, there you go. There you go. I just want to see your statue when it's done. That's what I want to see. <laughs> right. <laughs> We got we got we to get back into sales, man, because these people are like, yeah. all right, cool. DB wants to build an institute. What the fuck's in it for me? <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, real quick, back kind of on that side of things. Like, what are some buy? Okay, so we talked about the crappy, like, hey, this just killed the deal. What are some buy triggers? Like, what have you found of like in the psychological side of 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 sales and everything? Like, what is a buy trigger? Yeah, so um, I think it's really important that uh, if you're listening to this, you understand that all buyers are not equal. Um, William Marston, I don't know where, I've got this book back there. Uh, William Marston was kind of the foundational guy um, that created personality styles. That is what the whole disc assessment is based on is all of his research. The guy did three really, really cool things. He came up with personality styles. He created the polygraph test 
and he created Wonder Woman, the cartoon character. So very interesting guy. Um, and so I did a, a lot of study and that's what I always try to do. When I want to learn about something, I go up and up and up and up and up. And I try to get to the very root of like, where did all the information come from? And so William Martson basically says that um, if I know you better than you know me, I can control the conversation. If I know you better than you know yourself, I can control you. And so this gets into some ethical stuff with persuasion is, you know, Jedi mind tricks. You got to use it for good, not bad. Um, but what I would say is learning the four main personality styles, which, you know, Sales Excellence University is kind of like my first stage of building that institute. You know, I talk about this in there and you have to understand that there's four main personality styles and each of those personality styles want to be sold a different way, right? Yeah. If you have the relationship person, they really kind of need to be coddled. It's a longer sales process. They're going to need you to actually push them over the cliff to, to make the purchase versus like the type A director personality. Don't give them a stack of paperwork. They don't want to read that, man. They want one sheet that shows exactly what it is, what's it do for them and how much does it cost and when do they get it? Yeah. So understanding the type of personalities is very important, but the, the, the layer below that or above it, however you want to structure that is having some type of a sales process. Um, because without having a methodical approach to the sales process, I mean, you're just shooting from the freaking hip. That's, yeah. that's like Tom Brady trying to go in and play on Sundays as much as I hate Tom Brady, um, you know, trying to play on Sundays and not and him and Belichick being like, you know what? Screw it, man. We're not going to have a game plan we'll this week. Like, let's just go see what happens. It's not going to work out. Um, and so I've came up with the SOSC sales process. It stands for struggle, opportunity, solution, and close. And so um, with that inside of there, the first point of the sales process should always be discussing with the customer their struggles and let them talk, right? Right. Um, if you guys don't I'll know this trick, guys, need. fellas, I'm talking to you right now. Um, when your lady gets home from work for the first 15 minutes, just shut up and ask her how her day was. <laughs> and for 15 minutes, I mean, it's going to unravel and you're going to look at your watch. I'm like, God, is this ever going to end? <laughs> but I promise after 15 minutes, it'll all be over and you're good. And like, you just, you got one, you got one check mark in the column, right? Gold star. Same thing with clients. When I talk to clients, I'm like, hey, what's, what's really bothering you with your sales and marketing? You know, if I'm talking to our state farm agents that are clients, I say, you know, where's your biggest challenge in where you're spending your advertising dollars right now? And, and they'll come, they'll, they'll start spewing. When they stop talking, wait three seconds. It's that pause you were talking about, Josh. It's that when, they, when they finish giving you whatever they're puking out to you, say, hmm, nine times out of 10, they'll start talking again. Because yeah. when they hear that, hmm, interesting, could you tell me a little more? Like, people love telling you the problems. And so what we do is in the struggle, we let them just get winded as hell. They're just giving us all these struggles that they're facing. Inside of there, we're taking notes, and then we move into the opportunity. So out of all the struggles that the client just shared with me, I'm going to try to find some opportunities where we could work together and I could make their life better. And we're going to discuss those opportunities and, and what those might look like and how those might feel and the, and the um, experience that that would bring and the results that it might drive. And I'm going to get their feedback. So now we're going to give and take. Then we're moving to where it's my time to shine. Now I have to pitch them on the solution. And it's yeah. like, look, Dick, out of everything that we've talked about, not, like the guy's name's Dick, not call the client Dick. <laughs> but he, he out of everything, we'll call him Bob. That's better. Uh, listen, Bob, out of everything we've talked about here today, you know, you shared a lot of stuff with me. Um, I, I see a ton of opportunity where we could help you out. And, you know, I think we're both on the same page here. Here's a solution I think we should work with moving forward. And lay it on. Yeah. When you get done laying that on them, say, how do you feel about that? If they're a right brain person, they're not going to like that. They're going to see, they're going to want to hear, what do you think about that? This is where the personalities are important because that is something that could botch a sell up is if you ask someone how they feel, but they're a right brained director thinker, they're going to be like, I don't feel anything, bro. I don't make decisions based off of feelings. I make them make them off of logic. So that's why it's so important because you could come through all of that as great as all that sounded and say, how's that feel? And they're going to be like, I don't know. I don't, don't want to do business with you. So knowing, yeah. you know, how do you think, what do you think about that? How do you feel about that? 
whatever their answer, answer is, and then moving them into the close. That's the SOSC process. And if you'll just implement that in your business, I promise you, you'll start closing more deals like today because you'll have a methodical approach versus just going to the customer and saying, okay, what do you want to look at today? <laughs> no one just yeah, kind of fucking tossing it out there, giving them a price and saying, Sayonara, hope you liked me better than anybody else you get a quote from. <laughs> um, you know, I try to sell and I teach people to sell from the mindset that you're building lifelong relationships with clients. There, there should even be competition. There is nobody else. You, you're the best. They'd be crazy not to go with you. And if you don't have that enthusiasm and that confidence, you're, you're, you're done, man. Because the guy that does walk in wearing the suit, feeling like he feeling like a million bucks and he owns the world and the customer would be crazy not to do business with him. He's going to take the bacon because 90% of the time people buy on enthusiasm and then they support it with logic. They're like, wow, that guy was so amazing. So high energy. He just seems awesome. I trust him. And I mean, the quote makes sense. It does what we said it needs to do. It's <laughs> within budget. Let's do business with him. Yeah. And so yeah. that's, uh, Hopefully that, hopefully that gave you a little bit of value there. <laughs> hopefully somebody Mike, took some notes on that one. <laughs> Michael Geller said something really cool. He's, he was a magician forever, if you didn't know. Uh, and he said that one time uh, he was talking about price to somebody, one of the other magicians, and the magician said, don't have somebody buy you on price because there's only one of you. Have somebody buy you because there's only one Mike Geller, right? So that's the kind yeah. of concept that you say, like buy you and the rest is just the detail side of it. If, if, if you see a little kid run into the car, in, into the street and there's cars coming, you would go and push that kid. You would knock everybody out of your way. You would knock food out of people's hands and make people drop their phones and break iPads and whatever else to go save that little kid because you know 100% that that is the right thing. And the only thing to do is to save that little kid. That's how you go into jobs is you, you know when you go in there, and it takes time to kind of get that confidence like you're saying, but if you go in and you know for 100% fact that hiring you is like saving that little kid, then everything else that comes in the way is just, it's, it doesn't matter because this is the right thing to do. You know that it's the right thing to do. If you don't know Absolutely. it's the right thing to do, you, you're not confident in yourself, then they're not going to be confident. And, and I mean, let's not get it twisted. We're selling a service. Like there's really only three types of business, right? There's, there's products, there's services. And then in this day and age, in this economy, there's venture funded companies, which, you know, their only job is just to stay in business until the next round of funding. They're not profitable. Like, and those, their time will come and they'll be out of here. But when you're selling a service business, a service business, you're selling yourself, your staff, and then your past results, that's it. That is all the people care about is like, who have you serviced that I might know? That's why we love having, you know, testimonials and things like that, because it's really yeah. important. The team, talking your team up. And if you're that owner operator, like that's why I also say that being an owner operator in the cleaning business, bro, it's so easy to sell. Because if you can lay that chip on the counter, you've like, you've eliminated. Because yeah. all you have to say is, Hey, Dick, <laughs> listen, you're getting me. You, you yeah. get me, bro. I'm going to be the one here cleaning your windows. Don't you trust that I'll do a good job for you? And you can really like start to sell and kind of make it personal because it yeah. is. And I yeah. see so many, and I did this guys. This is why I'm telling you from experience is like, I did this when I was still an owner and operator. I try to sell like we were this big, huge company. And now that we're like a pretty decent sized company, fuck, I try to go and sell like I'm the owner operator. I'm like, you're getting to deal with me. And, and, right. and my certified pros, my team that I train personally, like, because you realize that big companies, man, their time has come and gone. That's why I really, again, I think we're about to go through the 1920s. The 2020s are going to be the 1920s all over again. Uh, I'm going to love coming back and looking at this podcast in 2025 and be like, told you so, uh, because <laughs> it, it's, it's just going to happen. There's, there's more people with side hustles now than there's ever been. They work a 40 hour a week job and they're selling Arbon on the side. They're doing this and they're doing makeup or Tupperware parties. And look, there's a lot of people that will hate on them because it's an MLM scheme, but that's only because there hasn't been legitimate side hustles that have provided those opportunities. When, when companies start realizing, and I'll give you guys a little insight. My office team works three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's it. I don't want them there 40 hours a week. When you're somewhere 40 hours a week, you start to hate your fucking job. When you're yeah. somewhere five days a week with the same people, you kind of start to butt heads. 
these people can't butt heads. See you on Monday. See you on Wednesday. See you on Friday. <laughs> They're happy. I have the happiest staff I've ever had in the past 11 years of being an entrepreneur. Um, I'm really kind of starting to dig in there and I really think they're more efficient because when they get there, they know it's time to perform. It's time to get it done. Um, Fresh. I, I just think that the, we're about to go through the 1920s again, man. And if, if you're the person that has the balls to say, I'm going to go out and try to make it on my own um, and you skill up, right? Because I have to, I can't like, Hammer on that enough. I had a coach when I played basketball in high school. I wasn't great by any means. I was really smart. Like, I graduated with 3.75, so, like, that's why I was on all these teams. I figured that out later on. But, you know, I asked Coach Jones. Coach, coach Jones tells me, he's like, DJ, you just hustle and play harder and with more heart than anybody else on the team. And I look at Coach Jones. I said, why the fuck am I sitting on the bench? <laughs> <laughs> because you don't have the skills. And I was like, whoa, okay, all right. So when I went into business, that's why I started learning sales. That's why I taught myself marketing and advertising and became a student was because I realized that I can work really, really, really hard and have a lot of hustle, drive, and ambition. But if I don't have the skills, that whole, um, what's the saying, uh, talent, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. It's complete bullshit. <laughs> like if a kid can shoot a three in your eye and cross you over, I don't give a fuck how hard you play. You're not beating him. And so, yeah. you know, that's kind of a misconstrued me message that's put out there. And I think it's equally as important in business. You've got to skill up, but if you're willing to do it, man, life will give you whatever you put out into the universe and what you're willing to work for. Jim Rohn says this, life doesn't give us what we want. It gives us what we deserve. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I, I dig that. Like people, anytime somebody's like, oh, I, I'm having trouble. I, I can't figure marketing that works. I, it's, I just, I, I'm not able to sell. Well, go get a book. Go get a book on sales. Oh, no, it's not that. I'm really good. I'm really good at sales, but, but it's, well, you're not. Like, I'm sorry, but you're having yeah. problems doing that. Learn, learn. This is our college, right? We know what we're going to do for the rest of our lives, or at least the foreseeable future. Learn everything you can. Like, it's not bad Absolutely. to go you know, everybody that I do interviews with too, you look in the very back and there's books every time, every single time. Why is that? Like, Jim, Jim Rohn said, all the information you could ever need in life has been written in all the books that you haven't read yet. Mm -hmm. And, and that's it's just the true, questions man. you ask. Absolutely. You know, I'm mildly dyslexic. That's like one of my downfalls is, you know, I, I actually just recorded a couple podcast episodes last night talking about, um, you know, not necessarily disabilities, but, you know, things that may, may put you at a disadvantage. And, you know, one of them is that I'm mildly dyslexic. I didn't know that in school. It wasn't until I got out of school um, that I realized why my reading comprehension skill was so low. Why when I'm handwriting stuff, I switch letters. And, and when I'm reading, I switch words. It's just a different level of dyslexia. And so reading books was always very, very difficult for me because I would read a paragraph and I'm slow. Like Tori, my girlfriend, she could smoke a book, man. Like two days, she reads a whole book. I'm over here like the red <laughs> box. Like I read word for word. And so, you know, my disadvantage, I'm like, all right, well, this disability or disadvantage, how can I make that something positive for me? And that's when I found Audible and audiobooks and podcasts. And the cool thing is my listening comprehension is super high. So I list audiobooks at like 1.5, 1.75. And oh, wow. people will get in the car with me and they're like, the fuck are you listening to, bro? And I'm like, oh, oh, razor 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 razor. Razor. Yeah, it's, it's Tim Ferriss. It's four hour work week. It's like my seventh time listening to it. I'm like, I can't understand anything he's saying. I'm like, oh, that makes sense to me. I'm right. like, whoa. <laughs> there, now I took my disadvantage and now it's an advantage because I can, I can do it. So a lot of times I'll buy books and then I'll follow along in them and, and listen to the audio books. So it's almost like they're reading to me. And I remember in school, the teachers used to always be like, DJ, why aren't you taking notes? I'm like, I don't need to take notes. I just need to listen to you talk. No, take notes. I'm like, all right, I'll take notes. And like, I, just, I yeah. never really had a study for testing stuff. Um, so I think that's a, another cool thing about entrepreneurship is there's no concrete way to do it. Everybody's life is different. Everybody has different advantages and different disadvantages. But I want you to know something that where you're at right now doesn't determine where you go. It only determines where you start. And if you can believe in yourself, but no one else was like, I had to look friends in the face. I had to look guidance counselors in the face. I had to look my teacher in the, like I was going to be a chemical engineer, man. I had scholarship offers. My chemistry teacher thought I was fucking crazy. And in my mind, I knew that I could do this. I'm like, if, 
if, if I can believe in myself when no one else will, that's all I need because nobody can stop me at that point. And I've been doing it 11 years now. And I mean, I've had losses. I mean, two years ago, I lost a half a million dollars in real estate in a six figure business. So it doesn't come without setbacks. And I wish more guys that kind of have the microphone, right? The, the Gary's and the Grant's and Tony Rob, like I would love to know what three of Tony Robbins biggest losses were in business. But I think those guys live in a, in a generation ahead of us and they're so torn up in their ego, they don't want to share it. Um, but I know that on podcasts and things like this, if I can talk about my failures, my disadvantages, I know that you have things that are not going right in your life. I know you have things that if you're listening right now, have set you back. And I, I want to be the one to tell you that no matter what that is, you can overcome it and move forward and chase your dreams. Yeah, yeah. I dig it, man. If, if you haven't, if you're listening right now too and you haven't checked out uh, Coach Carroll's podcasts, media, books, all of, you've listed off so many things. Man. If you haven't. Yeah. Hashtag Coach Carroll. You know, like that's why I start, like I started, started telling people, I'm like, what's your favorite platform? And they're like, uh, Instagram. Great. Hashtag Coach Carroll. What's your favorite platform? LinkedIn. Hashtag Coach Carroll. Like you'll find me because I'm kind of like, you're, it's either going to be me or it's going to be Pete Carroll, the coach of the Seattle Seahawks. So, um, <laughs> and we're pretty distinguishable. So uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you'll be able to tell the difference. <laughs> nice. So check it all out. It's definitely uh, worth it, man. I, I, I dig it. This is the longest uh, podcast that we've done. So uh, I, I could best, talk bro. literally for another uh, bunch of hours, but I'm not going to. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> if you're listening, you know what time uh, it's the end of the show. I'm going to give you your 5% code. This week, if you order your supplies through me, uh, this week's 5% code is COACH. That's going to be the, the 5% key. All you got to do is call me, 862 312 2026. Put your order in or text me, say, hey, man, everything's in my cart, and tell me the word COACH. You'll get 5% off your order. Whew. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, man. I really, really do appreciate it. And um, yeah, until next week, go out there and be epic.